We forced them at first. We were like, you, come, say something. You can't say you, you don't have any idea. So some few people who, you, those who usually show the, their disagreement by shaking, you see that they take um, the initiative and do small, small talk. And before we realize, even though they don't mix with the men, but they don't sit at the back anymore. They come and they also find their spot and they sit closer. And a few of them really tell us what they, the women, are thinking. And it's changing things. I'm really happy to be moderating this session um, at the conference this week because this is a topic that is really, really close to my heart. As a reporter, I've met many women in developing countries who are struggling to make a living and struggling to provide for their families and for themselves. Um, some of them are, are subsistence farmers. Some work on family farms. In many countries, women are really the backbone of the agricultural sector and the food production system. According to statistics from the United Nations, 80% of agricultural workers in Africa are women, and 60% are in Asia. Women also play a key role in household food security. Uh, they are responsible for being the primary caregiver in their families, uh, storing, producing, cooking, and cleaning food, and making sure that it's available for their children. Women are central when it comes to ensure, ensuring the health of their children, because an undernourished woman will give birth to a baby with low birth weight, birth weight and that perpetuates the cycle of undernutrition and poor health. According to the World Bank, 870 million people still suffer from hunger across this globe, and most of them are women and children. 20 years ago, the Beijing Platform for Action emphasized that women were the key to reducing poverty and ensuring food security. It called on member states and stakeholders to implement policies to enhance women's access to financial, technical, and marketing services. But today, women still continue to face barriers and constraints, including limited access to resources necessary for food security. More importantly, their rights and their socioeconomic status are rarely equal to those of men in many developing countries. And this disempowerment undermines their ability to secure food and nutrition for their families. In many places, women still suffer institutional and cultural discrimination, lower levels of education, restrictions on their access to credit, technology, and financial services. The OECD reported that only 5% of agricultural aid worldwide in 2011 was earmarked for women, only 5%. But there has been progress. Developmental aid is now moving from completely gender-blind programs to ones that are more gender-aware, recognizing the different needs of men and women. Projects are paying attention to gender gaps when it comes to allocating resources. But obstacles still remain, many of them. More needs to be done in many areas, which we're going to be talking about. Uh, we need to build the evidence base so we can continue to measure progress. We need to continue to strengthen assets. And there's evidence of a widening gender gap when it comes to accessing new technologies in agriculture for women. I want to start with this idea that there are still obstacles for, for women. and. We'll talk more about it uh, during this hour. But the Food and Agricultural Organization estimates that if women had the same access to resources worldwide as men do, their yields could increase by up to 30%, which would feed 150 million more people around the world, which is an astounding figure if you think about it. So why don't they have equal access? Lynn, can we start with you? Sure. Thank you, Melissa. Is this working? Yeah, I think so. Um, what are the obstacles <coughs> to women having equal access? Well, I expect we can all relate to them. Uh, clearly, land ownership and control is an issue. Uh, it's the fertilizers, getting hold of fertilizers, clean seed varieties, seeds which are um, biofortified 
and can be used to strengthen the nutrition of different areas, the average smallholder female farmer in an underdeveloped country cannot get hold of this unless uh, they get some help. Um, the organization that I'm chair of, the Consultative Group of International Agricultural Research Centers, has 15 centers around the world, and they specialize in crops, crops and natural resources. And one of the things that the crop centers make sure that they do is actually we will send out of our, from our gene banks any, any seeds or germplasm which would be helpful for, uh, uh, for smallholder par farmers. The ultimate user of the CG is the small farmer. So that's a big deal. And um, I wanted just to spend a moment to, to mention that to you, because you may not have heard of this organization. It's got an impossible acronym, <laughs> and nobody will change it, despite the fact that the chair <laughs> has very strong views on it. Um, with land become, comes the ability to raise credit. Uh, many of you, I expect, will have read Hernando de Soto's book on land ownership in South America and how impossible it is for men and women to actually get the capital to get really good fertilizer, if they have to buy it on the market, to get really good seeds um, and germplasm, if they have to buy it on the market from a big international company, um, and even to get processing equipment. So. That is important. We work with, with a lot of microfinance organizations like uh, Grameen and, and BRAC. You will have heard that the founder of BRAC got the World Food Prize last week in Des Moines, which is very exciting. We supported, supported him and used his services over the years a lot. But the last thing I want to mention, <coughs> really, is what the, one of the real obstacles for women apart from gender norms, which we'll talk about in a moment, because <clears throat> I'm sure all of us have strong views about that, um, is market access. A woman may become very capable of growing things, have a small plot, it's good, it provides resources, but how to scale up, how to get that, that product, whatever it is, to market. And I just want to give you a quick example of something which we worked with which will give you an idea of how difficult it is. So in Latin America, in the western part of Latin America, children are very short of vitamin A. Has huge impacts on them in many respects, all of which I'm sure you know. So um, we developed the center in, in Peru, the National International Potato Center, developed um, sweet potatoes to which they biofortified with vitamin A so that the, the new product would have vitamin A in it and could be eaten. Well, that's great. So the farmers say, well, why, why should I grow this? It's a new product. Nobody knows it. And the, <coughs> uh, the wholesaler says, well, why would I go and pick it up and, and take it to a retailer? The re retailer won't want it. And uh, the retailer says, well, I'm not sure what women think about it. You know, it's orange fleshed. I don't want my children eating that orange thing. So we, you have to do a whole... Um, a whole arrange teaching within the retail sector and the consumer sector of exactly why this product is what it is and make make recipes out of it put it on television it's a huge chain from that one growth to the end to make something really really click and really be profitable in um, in the uh, in the marketplace and that is where women are extremely disadvantaged. And it's something which perhaps is not given the, the attention along with the fertilizer, the seed varieties, the training, the technology, the, uh, um, um, the community involvement. Uh, that's not uh, mentioned. I was going to talk about the first thousand days too, Melissa. You know, if women farmers, sh uh, the, the families of women farmers, because women do spend the money on the family, are always better, have better nutrition. Um, and that first thousand days is a huge loss for the world in the future. It's a, a self-perpetuating and terrifying loss of children who are stunted and who grow up to produce more and more stunted children. Um, 
The other thing which I will mention in passing, perhaps I'll talk about later, is it's very important to, di to, aggregate, to disaggregate the data. You know, 20 years ago, we could all have a conversation generally about women, but, and, the, and the development world was very good at putting out money to support women in different initiatives. But the data was not disaggregated between women and men. So if you don't have a baseline to start with, you've got nothing to compare. Uh, now everything is being mainstreamed, as Melissa mentioned, by international organizations. There is an absolute insistence on disaggregation of the data because the impacts on the different genders are very different, whatever the scientific um, experiment being performed. So I'll, I'll leave it there. That's a great introduction. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about land ownership, which is one of the first things you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And Celie, this is your area of expertise, especially in developing countries, because we've seen that it's one thing for a country's constitution to enshrine women's rights, but it's quite another for those rights to actually be enforced, for lack of a better word. Can you tell us, Celie, what you're seeing in the high courts in some of these countries? Sure, and maybe it makes sense to first kind of talk about what we mean by land rights for women, because ownership is really one, in a way, small aspect of it. We were talking right before the panel, and hopefully Ruka will talk about it a little bit more. In most parts of the rural world, land is not actually up for private ownership, right? It's communally owned. It's, 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 it's governed by customary laws or rules, and so, Ownership or land rights for women in particular really means a continuum of rights, right? It could mean ownership in some context, but really it could be access to that land to till it. Mm -hmm. It could be access to a forest to collect berries or other sort of non-timber product. It could be making decisions about that land, what crops to plant, when to plant them, when to sow, when to reap. Um, it could be just being able to stay on the land in your matrimonial home once your spouse passes away, right? So it's a real sort of continuum of, of rights to that land. And as, as you mentioned, in most countries of the world, I think now it's up to about 70% of the countries in the world in their constitutions, their gender equality clauses. Not in ours, in the US, but, <laughs> <laughs> but in, in over 70% of the constitutions, newer constitutions of the world, you have that enshrined Sorry. in the Constitution, right? And then we have about 115 countries that have laws that specifically say women should have equal ownership rights to land, right? And in about 80 of them, it says women should have equal access to inheritance, right? So we have a, a good number of these laws, but then when we look at the practices, we see that in more than half of those countries that even have those laws, it is really the discriminatory practices that really curtail that kind of access. So women around the world, as you can imagine, have been challenging that. And since you ask about courts, I'll just give a couple of examples that some of you, um, many of you perhaps already know about. And perhaps the most well-known case from about a decade ago from South Africa, which really kind of started courts around the world from Africa to India and back to say that inheritance is something that women and girls should have is the Bay case from the Constitutional Court of South Africa, Bay as in B-H-E. And in that case, the mother of two young girls brought a case because in her community, when the father of the daughters died and they were not married, right, um, they had no access to the land of the home where they were living. So they were actually living in a home. That land, once the father died, was given to his father, and he wanted to lease that out to somebody else. And so these two little girls had to leave the home, and so their mother uh, brought this claim on their behalf. And it traveled up to the Constitutional Court of Africa, uh, of South Africa, and this is, um, you know, about a decade after a new, most progressive of the constitutions in the world has been put in place in South Africa. And that court said, yeah, that doesn't make sense, right? We know that's a customary law in that particular community, but that doesn't make sense given what we have in our constitution and sort of our new outlook about our country as a country of equality and struck that. Right? And since that case in 2004, countries around the world have cited to that case saying that's not okay. But then a few years ago in Tanzania, two widows, um, they were seamstresses or tailors, 
and they married when they were teenagers. They were widowed by the time they were in their early 20s. So between them, they had four young children, and two sort of separate households, but similar situations in that, in both cases, the matrimonial home where they were living their entire lives were things that were purchased, whether beds or furniture, that they also contributed to were all given to the, the brother-in-law, right? The, the brother of their deceased um, husband. And they challenged that. But their high court in Tanzania said, you know, we agree with you that that's not right, that you should be able to stay in your home and your children should be able to stay in your home. But if we open that, and they quote said, Pandora's box of discriminatory customary laws in our country of 120 <coughs> different tribes, then there's just going to be too much chaos. And they sort of said, we agree with you, but we're gonna leave it as is. And they decided to actually continue and challenge that and took it up to the UN Committee on Women's Rights which just this March actually issued the first decision ever on that international level that says, it said to Tanzania in particular, that you can't do that, right? That when you deprive girls and women of inheritance rights, you're not just doing something that's discriminatory, you're in fact taking away their livelihood and taking away their access to services, to health, to food. And so that's on that level, but I really wanted to kind of bring it a full circle to the United States and say that within I think most of our lifetimes in this room, the Supreme Court in our country said that women and men have equal property rights. So if, you, if some of you remember, those of you who may have legal background, in 1981, the US Supreme Court in Kirchberg v. Finstra, you know, the famous case of Ms. Finstra, whose husband put their marital home up for a mortgage against a debt that he had, and then couldn't pay the debt. He left his wife, incidentally, but the creditors came to take their matrimonial home. She didn't know that he did that. He didn't need to consult with her. This was in Louisiana that gave husbands sort of head and master privileges so he could make unilateral decisions about the matrimonial home. And it wasn't until 1981 in this country that our Supreme Court said that's actually not okay. So, you know, I think women are challenging this in different parts of the world, but I wanted to also make sure that these are not issues that are entirely foreign even in our context. But it's hard to fight customary law, right? I mean, you can see that some women in many countries, and I'm thinking of Afghanistan because I've seen it, and I know, Zili, you've worked there, you know, they can take a dispute to, to a court, but still they'll settle it in a local shura, they'll settle it within the local village. And those places, that's where customary law still it discriminates against women. How do, you, how do you get around that? Well, for example, the organization I work with now, Landessa, has had really phenomenal experience working with traditional leaders and elders in communities around the world, right? And really coming from the understanding that first of all, these leaders want their communities to be prosperous and peaceful. Right, so their aim primarily is to reduce conflict within their community, and most conflicts tend to be about land. They tend to be intra-household conflicts about property and land. I think it's probably true in the U.S. too. And so whether it's there or here, the idea was, for example, I'll give you um, a story from a project Landessa worked on in Kenya right after Kenya in 2010 adopted <coughs> a new constitution, a constitution that actually for the first time in their history uh, guaranteed that women would have uh, sort of equal rights to uh, at least manage and control land. And this was a new thing um, in that context and was part of sort of broader land reform that the country was undergoing. And you can imagine that in certain rural areas and this project focused on the Rift Valley of Kenya, which is between Kenya and Tanzania, very rural community, the Maasai community that lives there, which is semi-nomadic. They didn't know this constitution was just passed. They certainly didn't know what it meant in practice to have these rights for women. And so this project initially thought, well, we'll just tell the women, tell the girls and the women, look, you have this new right in the constitution, hooray. And as, as we know from other projects, if you only talk to the women, and I know we're gonna talk about sort of men and, and, and boys involvement, if you only talk to the women and they feel really empowered, and they go to the chief and they say, hooray, look, we have this constitution, there's a provision here that seems helpful to me, he may not even know about it, right? Because nobody bothered to tell him, <laughs> right? Nobody bothered to show the chief, who is supposed to actually be taking care of disputes within his community that the law has changed that there are certain new ways that we're gonna be looking at this. And so the project really started talking to the elders and the leaders. And at first there was a lot of 
resistance and saying, what? Now women are going to control household decisions about land. This will be chaos. This will only increase strife and conflict, which we already had before. Elders said before men might lease uh, matrimonial land or matrimonial property out without consulting the wife, but not bring the proceeds back to the family, which actually would perpetuate sort of cycles of poverty. So they knew that this was a problem, and this constitutional provision was actually aiming to remedy that. And so after actually working both with the elders and leaders and with the understanding that they're the ones who have the social legitimacy and the influence within their community as well as with the women, so they will know what those rights are and also be able to present their claims. So a lot of it was even presentation skills. You know, How do you go out and make your claim in this room of elders? Because the elder councils were all men, right? So that could be intimidating in any context. And what was interesting is that the elders then had a, you know, a really interesting transformation. One, you know, very traditionally dressed Maasai leader in, in, in the documentary that we did on this project, which you can Google, um, said, you know, how is it that women can raise remarkable leaders but cannot be remarkable leaders themselves, right? That doesn't make any sense. And, and by 2014, by last year, the elders council of 50 elders now has 33 women, where they had no women before. Because women have now been seen as not only knowing what these sort of rights are, but how to mediate and be able to transmit that kind of knowledge back. And then it, it, it really is interesting that the leader ends by this documentary by looking at the tree where people used to line up to you know, put out their grievances and disputes. And he says, look, there's nobody, nobody here today at all. We used to have lines, but now there's nobody here because now people know how this should be resolved. They don't even need to come to us for, for that kind of discussion. So it is true that there are these lingering obstacles and uh, you know, we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll hear I'm more Yeah, about I'm going them. to Ruka but next. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think there are also ways to kind of work with them. So, Ruka, I mean, Ghana is a country where there have been so many examples of well-documented examples of weaknesses in land governance, right? I read about a, a chief in the Ashanti region who sold his land to outsiders and then all his people lost their livelihoods, you know, and there was no, nothing they could do about it. Can you talk a bit more about how civil society organizations are trying to change that in Ghana? Yeah, so like the... Um Zili was just saying, all the things that you have labeled out, like letting people get to know about these issues, uh, because it's really serious. We say customary lands, and then um, we all know that customary lands are supposed to belong to everybody in the community. It doesn't matter who, even the, because when we were in school, we learned that um, those lands are for everybody, even the unborn kids. But now, what the um, opinion leaders who are supposed to be protecting these lands are doing, they are rather using it for their selfish gains. A lot of them are selling them, even without consulting the, the community members. In certain cases, you even follow up and then you come and find out even the elders that he is supposed to take counsel and then discuss matters trivial to the community are not aware that the chief has done that. And now even um, community leaders besides the chiefs, like uh, the family heads who are also usually a land that is for this particular family, he has the right and then he calls people to make decisions about them. They also go behind the families and then they sell this land. So it's something that is very worrying. And then what we're doing is we, we're trying to conscientize the people to kind of know that food is everything. And if you sell the lands of your community members and they cannot have access to lands to produce their own food, what is going to happen? Even their living conditions is going to become even poorer because now they have to dis um, look for other economic activities they can do besides the farming that they are used to in order to be able to buy food that they could have produced for themselves. So it's really serious. So a lot of the things that we're doing, we're doing the <coughs> advocacy and the outreach issues and then maybe interventions and trying to let people does us from some things like that. Can we talk, a, explore a little more? Uh, Silly, you were getting at this earlier, but the idea of having to educate men as well. Mm -hmm. How hard is that to, to have men and boys sort of understand what the laws are? It's, it's, it's quite, um, is, is, it, is there in the right direction? Because um, what we learned over the time was um, previously, certain um, 
things we were trying to push for them to do, include women, was not working because you could see that it was an all-women affair. Only women come and they are making noise. We want to be passed, we want to be. So what we did was we re-strategized. We brought the men on board. Because from my personal experience, I have my family. The men have been those who have motivated me to actually do certain things that I couldn't do. So I saw that if we wanted to achieve more results, then we had to work hand in hand with them. So what we do is when we go for these kind of advocacies and education, we kind of include men and let the men do the talking when it comes to including women. And then we cite examples for them, areas where women have been included, areas where women have been given the opportunity to take decisions or take part in decision making and how things have worked for them, how things are changing for communities that have women part of their decision making. So this is helping a bit. Can we talk a little bit about established gender roles when it comes to agriculture? Because, you know, I said earlier in the intro that that most of agricultural workers in the world are, are women, but yet they have these very established roles that are not quite equal to those of men. Women, you know, in these societies, especially in rural places, men are the ones who you know, till the land, sow the seeds, harvest the crops, and women have been relegated to sort of supporting roles, feeding animals, you know, weeding, weeding crops, right? How, how do you, Lynn, I'll start with you, how do you think these established roles make it harder for women to claim their, their rights, and what needs to be done to change that perception? It's hugely difficult, of course, and in some countries much more difficult than others particularly where it's backed up with religion, by religious norms as well as all the traditional norms, um, where it's backed up with family peer pressure from an elder generation that has subjected themselves to these um, standards, perhaps unwillingly, perhaps not. It, um, it's reinforced throughout in, in many, in ma many organizations and many uh, countries. We found that the best, one of the things which was not well understood was a, sen a sense of self-esteem, that a woman cannot negotiate that joint work, which Ru Ruka talks about, cannot negotiate that change of equal, equaling out of decisions unless they have a sense of self-worth. It, it's all a question of bargaining and we did a lot of work on workshops with helping women in their own particular situation, um, finding a way through to get joint control of a number of, uh, of, of their work. And in fact, joint control is a great deal more satisfactory. Again, as, as Ruka said, experiments have been done with plots of land, with women uh, alone telling them, uh, men alone working them, and with joint arrangements. And Again, remember, land ownership is nice, but it's control of what goes on in the land, which is really important. And what happens is that the, the areas which are controlled by men and women actually do better than the, the, the performance of, of plots with, run by only men or only women. Uh, women. The only women, I'm afraid, are a little lower down the, the uh, chart. Um, I think that's a very important thing. There's a tremendous feeling ab about women's rights. We, we've got to try and get this across. But we can't right a wrong with another wrong. We have to get the men in the communities working with them uh, to see the sense of this and to understand that it's a win-win for both. Otherwise, one ends up with, of course, domestic violence mm -hmm. and a number of community difficulties, revolts, which merely um, uh, make the situation reversed to being worse than it was before. We have a lot of literature on that, uh, on that information. Um, Microenterprises are something which helps a woman have the self-esteem, coming from a very traditional background, uh, helps a woman have the self-esteem to go out, to negotiate, to find a price, to find a, a distributor, and so on. I, there's a group, for instance, uh, which, uh, of women in Brazil, who got together and said, there is no reason why the men should have all the money that comes out of forests. 
There is, for instance, a babusa nut that we can all go out and collect and sell, and it's ours. The uh, tradition has always been that, you know, the, the women did work, but then the moment cash started to come in through the door, then it, the control tended to pass to the men. This was what was happening in the, in the forest in, in, in Brazil. And uh, they now have, I won't say it's a huge enterprise, but they are supporting themselves and their family, and they're feeding their family properly, and they're educating their family properly, and they're being able to spend time with their family, you know, childcare being a real issue. Um, but it all comes down to understand to negotiating in a way that some societies are simply not, uh, not used to. Um, we also try, actually, to deal with scientists who are women. We really encourage African scientists who are women. Um, and we have a, a, um, a prize, if you like. Well, it is a prize. A lot of people apply for it. Um, called AWARD. And it's African Women in Advanced Research and Development. And uh, it's a two-year program. They come to us with degrees. And they get a mentor. 50% of the mentor are men, the mentors are men who really want to see women support in high scientific enterprises in their own country. Um, and they get a leadership program and they get uh, uh, an opportunity to present at a number of places and so on and so forth. And the idea is it helps, strengthens them to say, look, I'm a scientist. I've got, I want a doctorate in, in whatever it is. I want to get out there and be an, a leader in my scientific community. And um, this has been really quite, quite valuable. It encourages them to not to take the typical gender role which has been given to them, assigned to them, and to have the strength to go to their family, to go to their husbands in some case, or their, their children, and say, I have a role here, and I'm going to do it. And I cannot really under underemphasize the importance of uh, of role models. Are there are a number of these prizes around. Uh, keep your eyes open for them. Support them if you can. Um, but this is really putting aside the legalistic thing. And I want you to know, Tilly, that in Canada, women were not recognized as persons till the late 1920s, as you remember. So we're, we haven't got anything to pat ourselves on the back in the OECD countries either. Um, we have to work with these people to do this and to get, get out of the norms. And then gradually, as we've seen with our own efforts to try and get, say, women on boards and quotas appointed and so forth, it's very slow moving. Um, it will eventually come. It, it, uh, we, we've made some improvements of, in several percentages over the last uh, years in both North America and, and Canada, and, and we will start to see it. But it's a much more um, systemic issue than uh, we, we are prepared to, I think, prepared to admit. And it is different, of course, in every society, in every tribe, in every, every uh, country. And it needs to be tackled a slightly different way in every, every place. But we found the most successful thing is for women to work together and to be given a sense of self-esteem and importance, which otherwise they do not have under the traditional norms. Celia, I see you scribbling <laughs> some thoughts down there. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, add and, and perhaps challenge a little bit in that, you know, women do make up half of the agricultural workforce in the world, and in many countries, much more than half. So they're not only doing all of it, from the sowing to the tilling to the harvesting, but they're also taking care of households, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that part of gender roles is the part that we need to talk about more, because when there's talk about women's productivity being perhaps not as high as men's, you know, people just assume it's access to agricultural inputs, a better fertilizer, or better seeds. And sometimes it's simply being tired because you have multiple shifts that you're doing, right? And sometimes it means that the land that you do have access to is either a smaller plot or of lesser quality because that's the plot mm -hmm. that you were given. And I think that these kind of contextual elements are important. And then another point I wanted to just kind of add is the relation between particularly women's access and control and at times ownership over land 
and domestic violence is a bit murky and that there are studies that show that sometimes increased control reduces likelihood of being subject to intra-household violence, but there are also studies that show the opposite, right? And we know that when you upset gender norms or power dynamics, that could actually result whether in a temporary or, or prolonged spike in violence. So I think we have to also be very thoughtful about how we're looking at land reforms and imbuing people who didn't necessarily have legal formal rights to something before have them now and how the upset and the power dynamics can actually sometimes do harm and how to kind of think ahead of time how to how to mitigate that. Ruka, you are you seeing any of that in Ghana with your enterprise? Uh, yeah, um, sort of. And uh, because um, what we're doing is we like I said, we bring in the men on board and what we're doing, when you talk to the opinion leaders, most often when you go to the communities, you have opinion leaders being the men. So when you go and talk to them, you even set yourselves as examples and tell them what it is that you are doing, what you have been able to achieve as a woman just because you have been given the opportunity to be able to take up certain roles in the community. So when you say this, it kind of opens their minds and then they start to consider some of the, what um, Zili was just talking about. And then, um, like she was saying, the stereotyping, even some of the women back home themselves are promoting the stereotypes. You go to a home and you want the boy to wash the dishes, and the mother is like, no, 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 that's not the boy's job. She lets all the boys go out and only the girls do the work. So when we talk to the women, too, we try to conscientize them to stop thinking in that line. Because when you do that, they grow up with the same mentality and the women are relegated to the background. Uh, a particular example I'd like to share is when we started having meetings, community meetings. First, when we go for the meetings, the women will all sit in the back and uh, a bit even far from where the meeting is actually is and just listen. They don't say anything. So the first times we didn't understand why, but we were fine because the men were doing a lot of talking. But when we went back and assessed the whole process, we were like, no. So whatever we've come back with, whatever our findings, does not reflect everything. Some of the women have opinions too, because sometimes you see them in their small groups and they're chit-chatting and they're saying things. Sometimes the men will be saying something, and you see that the women are shaking their heads, and like they don't agree. But they are not going to say anything. They're just going to sit there and get up and leave. So we started talking to them. We forced them at first. We were like, you, come, say something. You can't say you, you don't have any idea. So some few people, who you, those who usually show the, their disagreement by shaking, you see that they take um, the initiative and do small, small talk. And before we realize, even though they don't mix with the men, but they don't sit at the back anymore. They come and they also find their spot and they sit closer. And a few of them really tell us what they, the women, are thinking. And it's changing things. So what she's saying is very right. It's not just about their owning stuff and this and it's for them to also get time and let the men take on more roles and then it will help them to, in the event that they're able to get the access to resources and those things, it will also go to kind of boost whatever it is that they're doing. Because if I have all the resources and I don't have enough time or I don't have the, I get so tired, I can't put in more effort than I'm already putting, then the results will just be the same. Just, just to add to that, if you don't mind, Melissa, in many countries that have undergone land reforms, and they, the government would allow a community to register the boundaries <coughs> of its community land, they would have, um, in some of these projects, they would have men and women draw a map of their community so that they can figure out where, how to demarcate that area for the community land. But when you look at the map that the men come back with and the map that the women come back with, and they're supposed to kind of say, you know, what is the most important part, you know, features of that community land. And it's so interesting, you know, the women really kind of emphasize the water source, you know, is really big on that <laughs> map, right? Because they have to get the water. You know, they will emphasize where um, the livestock is that they use every day. And then the men would not even have that on their maps. You know, they're kind of looking at the borders maybe with, uh, you know, 
neighboring community or they're looking at where the game might be or you know they're looking at sort of where the cash crops should be you know planted and when you look at these two maps you realize that people within the same community have very different perceptions based on their roles in the community of what that map and the access to the different resources should look like so it's always a really fascinating exercise yeah <laughs> very true can we talk a little bit about access to technology because a lot has been written about the fact that women might be more productive if they had access to better fertilizer, new technologies, better seeds. Um, Lynn, is that just oversimplifying the problem? Um, I think every little bit can help. Uh, anything which makes a woman not have to walk miles to get uh, firewood, for instance, uh, in order to cook or to warm the family is an example. It's a small thing, it's an example. It gives them more time to, with the children, which in turn makes the children flourish more. Um, I'm, I'm not, I think technology can be very helpful. I've seen farmers in Kenya with, a, with a, an iPhone um, finding out what the weather forecast is and saying, well, then I'm not going to use my fertilizer, which I've just bought, until after the rains, because it'll be washed away. Um, I've seen them take up insurance, weather insurance, crop insurance. If the weather is really bad, then they will get some money back from the insurance company. They pay, of course, a premium like we all do. Uh, th this is really revolutionized some areas that have access to a phone, where a woman can have access to a phone, you know, not only the man in the family has a phone, they have a share, they, they go back to the bargaining. Um, and also extension courses can be put on a phone. So a woman doesn't have to be able to read even, if it's not uh, really essential, they will listen to the phone. Everyone has a phone, not everyone has a television, but m everyone has a phone. And uh, a tremendous amount could be done through these phones in the way of giving people ideas about whether patterns of new types of uh, training, uh, new, new, type, new technologies, for instance, I've watched some women deal with drones in Mexico. Drones can go over the wheat fields and determine whether or not parts of the field need water, for instance or if parts of the field are clearly suffering through some kind of pestilence or uh, animal or whatever. And then the, they can pinpoint immediately, the farms are bigger in Mexico, of course, they can pinpoint immediately uh, what to do and not waste water, precious, precious water, wat uh, washing areas that don't actually need it. Um, women can operate those just as well as men and uh, enjoy it, but that's just that's a leading edge. It's not getting out across everywhere. Whereas the phone, the good old um, phone, cellular, which everyone carries with them, can be used as a tremendous agent of change for, uh, for women in agriculture and in many other respects for women, too. Um, I'll, uh, maybe I'll stop there. I don't know if you're going to talk about agroforestry, but uh, uh, I that's the kind of thing which really would help women and which is readily available, which we don't use enough. We don't use some of the pots um, which can be, uh, which are smokeless comparatively. So we don't have all these kids dying of, of, of uh, lung problems because they're sitting in the middle of a very crowded house with fire on all the time in the middle and the smoke going around. Uh, the, the, there are so many little things that can be done, as well as the more advanced uh, data and ana big data analysis um, for the most um, the most uh, nutritious crops or the crops which are the most uh, resilient to climate change and how to use those. Um, which every single one of those is an advance for a woman and will help with the time. You've heard that they may very well become tired. It's absolutely right, and their child care um, responsibilities can be uh, made a lot more valuable if they are if, if they have that extra time. So the technology, there's many ways of technology in a broad sense being used, and I'll talk about 
less electronic technology, perhaps if I get asked again or get the chance. <laughs> and, uh, um, but think of, think of those and what could be done and the difference that can be made in, in a woman's life. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to use that as a segue to ask Ruka about what's going on in her country when it comes to seeds, because there's the, pa the passing down of seeds has been a tradition mm -hmm. in your country when it comes to transferring knowledge between generations of women, and, and the keeping and sharing of seeds is really um, a very personal thing. Now there's a new bill in Ghana that would put the distribution of seeds in the, ha in the control of some multinational companies. Mm -hmm. And the argument, though, is that these seeds, as Lynn was just saying, you know, would increase production and, and Im ensure food security. So, Ruka, can you talk a little bit about the tension between tradition and technology when it comes to something like seeds? Yeah. So like you mentioned, yeah, that tradition is something that we revere because uh, from the places that we come from, you go to a community and it's really rural. The person doesn't even have anything. He's so dependent on the, solely dependent on whatever it is that he's producing. And then when they're done, at the end of the day, they have to make expenses, pay for children's school fees, pay for health and other things. At the end of the day, whatever they realize from the farming, they spend everything. Mm -hmm. So what saves them and keeps them going in the farming is them being able to save some of whatever it is that they produce to be able to continue with the farming. So you see that, so it's, it's quite, um, I, I am not really buying into the whole new seed bill because uh, when I looked at the bill, I was excited by the fact that it was going to, it, it was a new year edition that was um, uh, the genetic, <laughs> they, they say genetically modified, so they are going to do better with small, something small that you put in the ground, you get more yields and all those things. That's, that, that's interesting. But the, what it's going to do is these farmers, that tradition that they have of uh, saving seeds and then replanting the next season, that is what is keeping them going. So if they're going to pass this bill, who is going to make it um, difficult or impossible for them to be able to continue that tradition, it's going to really affect them, considering the weather conditions that we also have certain times we have challenges with drought and other things. So if I am this farmer, and what we do is sometimes um, somebody might even save um, seeds and termites or something will go and destroy mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So what is that person going to do? They go to their neighbors and borrow what they have, some of what they have, and come and replant. So, but this law is going to be such that they have to buy seeds every year. And you cannot <coughs> borrow if you if you if you if you borrow that means that you have to pay royalties to the companies that are doing so it's going to really affect um, them negatively and then eventually I don't even think they'll be able to continue the farming if that bill is passed. So they would rather not continue f farming than accept seeds from a multinational. So for me, what I am thinking is if the multinational companies can change some of the um, the sense in what do they, the agreements, some of the terms in the agreements, it's fine because we, we are happy that maybe so through somebody's little efforts or same efforts, you are getting more than you used to get. It's a good thing. But if they can relax some of those parts or make exceptions for the people from the really rural places, that are maybe you can uh, reuse some of the seeds, but for a certain period of time, you can borrow, but they should just make some so that they can blend the two together. We can't say that we want to be stuck in our old ways. There are new things that are happening. Times are changing. We need mm -hmm. to also change and do something so that mm -hmm. we can move with the, the changing times. But then we should, they should also see that whatever it is that we were doing used to be a good thing. It's not, it's not a bad tradition. So they should try and see how they can blend the two and then come up with something that would favor both of them. So that's what I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Ruka brings up 
the point that we want to think about in all of these different aspects is, is how do we make sure that there is community participation mm -hmm. and involvement with these kinds of new policies and decisions. And since you mentioned climate change, I mean, that's a great example of that, right? So one of the more popular things to do in terms of um, mitigation is the whole carbon trade, right? So in many countries, forests have been sort of set aside as protected areas for carbon sequestration, but that means that people who relied on those forests before are no longer allowed to go into those forests to forage for uh, byproducts, for foods, for medicinal plants, for other things that they used to do there to survive that were really very much part of their lives and their livelihoods. And that is sort of a classical example of, you know, the country may have been trying to do good, even though obviously they're benefiting financially from it too, but without involving the community and their, uh, the community's own sort of adaptation um, and, and uh, actually mitigation strategies here. So, you know, the kind of mitigation that we're talking about with different kinds of seeds that are being saved, people have been perfecting that over time. I mean, Rwanda women farmers have, 600 different kinds of beans that mm. they plant because they know that not every year you're going to have enough rain and mm. some years the climate is going to be changing the soil quality changes and and so they actually have those varieties that they've been indigenously if you will testing out so they are able then to adapt to different you know climate conditions but unless we really kind of involve the community and learn from these indigenous adaptation knowledge and techniques then we're actually in some ways uh, creating harms when we're, we're thinking on a global level that we're creating goods i think that's extremely true and it's true with a number of in, in a number of areas i mean we we, we mm -hmm. all hear of gmos and uh, there are various reactions to GMOs all around the world. Um, let's say it, in, a, in a country where food security is not existent, you are better off to feed the, we to, to feed the children than to feed the weevils. And really, you don't have a choice about whether to use genetically modified foods. Um, but I'd also like to make a comment that one cannot lose as Ruby said, you cannot lose the uh, traditional ways of doing things because some of them are very good. And in fact, the earth, the crops, the beans, the uh, pul pulses of various sorts, lentils, um, they do adapt to climate and to different areas. And that ability, that local knowledge, which will tell you which one will work under certain weather conditions and so on and so forth, you can't replicate that with a multinational set of seeds, particularly not if you have to sign contracts and which may or may not um, be fair to the ultimate farmer. And there are a number of examples of international organizations, they're not all like this, but some who have um, tied up farmers to say, you must buy our seeds, but not any others. And that is unacceptable, it's unethical behavior, uh, and. I, I really like to, um, to draw your attention to that. It, it is really damaging in, in countries where the, the, the food supply is not secure. And that's why we keep gene banks, which go back to 200 years or so, and we actually have family trees of plants, of what was crossed with what, which trait came from where, so that if there's a problem, uh, we can go back and see exactly where those, those traits, that DNA, came from. Uh, but I, I also want to talk about, I talked about technology before in an electronic sense. I want to talk about non-technology. There are a lot of things which can be done for a woman farmer if she only knows about them. And climate smart agriculture is really a, a real example. Um, Agroforestry, trees on farms. What is agroforestry? It is trees on farms as opposed to trees in forests. And there are more trees on farms than there are trees in forests, you may be interested to hear. And they have, they have several different um, objectives and uses, which are not generally, we've, we've found over 40 years, have not really been very well um, expanded. For instance, trees obviously can provide food. So if you're planting always with maize, you're uh, going to be um, perhaps open to a, um, a problem with the crop one year. You are devastated, not only because you can't provide any money to sell, but your, your family is not being fed. You know, 
just put a couple of avocado trees in and you get something. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of that kind of broad nutrition which, which can go on. Um, if you plant, if you interleave crops with, say, a fast-growing uh, species in the center so that the crop can be shaded as it, it grows, the food crop can be shaded as it grows um, by this larger, faster-growing um, intermediate crop, you will find that you can then cut the intermediate crop down when the crops have got big enough, and you can then use it to feed the, feed the cattle. And of course, the cattle provide manure. And immediately you get into a diversification, which is e extremely valuable. Uh, you could put up hedges to, pr to outline, to delineate your property, and animals can eat it. You know, ruminants, um, uh, ruminants, cattle, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, if you put a variety of crops in the soil, you will have a natural fertilizer. Mm -hmm. The nitrogen will be fixed. Um, you can put in, in and nitrogen is the easiest example, but there are other micronutrients which, which the soil can, re, um, re, can reabsorb, which will help you if you cannot afford fertilizer, you cannot get it, you don't have a cow. Uh, uh, Phytherbia. In Malawi, Phytherbia is a magnificent, well, in many places, but I'm going to give you an example of Malawi. Phytherbia is a tree which unusually sheds leaves when it's not raining in the dry climate, dry season. So when, they, when the rains come, they immediately produce mulch with the leaves which are on the ground, which in turn gives fertilizer to the soil. And it can actually increase production by a huge percentage for about 30, 30 meters around a tree. You don't have to plant a lot of trees to increase that, the, the strength of the soil in order to um, produce, have better crop for, better production for whatever crop you like to, uh, to speak with. It, um, some of these are, are really very important. The other thing is, and uh, Ruth just, just kind of alluded to can it. I, can I interrupt because you are alluded to it earlier, and I, I'm just looking at our time. Ah. Um, we can't really have this conversation without talking about climate change mm -hmm. and how that affects women mm -hmm. differently mm -hmm. than it does men. Mm -hmm. um, Ruka, you've seen firsthand in your country how drought and floods affect men and women differently. Can, we, can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. So for mostly the women, I think the women do everything when it comes to our settings. The men are just, um, they, they just have the title as head of the family. Yeah. But the mother is everything. When we are hungry, we don't care about our fathers. When they suck us from school, we don't go to our fathers. Everything is centered ab around the woman. So if they are putting in efforts to kind of uh, come up with economic activities they can do and um, to support the families and the communities. And then, so when these droughts and floods happen, it is they that are hit the most because it damages not just um, what they are producing for economic, it damages even poverty that we have. So now she is burdened with the headache of taking care of maybe people, but acc uh, accidents happen, people are sick and other things. She's burdened with that. Mm -hmm. She has to take care of this person, make sure they recover. She's looking at how she's going to go around. What ways can she come up with something so that the family can continue feeding until they are able to get back on their feet? So all these things kind of affect the women. Mm -hmm. So I, I am thinking, um, so what we are doing actually is uh, telling the women or teaching them to diversify so they should not just be concentrate on producing 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 mm -hmm. like they said some of them they produce and even market is a problem so what we teach them to do is to add value to whatever it is that they are producing so that they look around um, the varieties or category of crops that they are producing and then try to see how they are going to create a chain. For instance, our poultry mm -hmm. farm, what we're doing is we're creating the opportunity for people to get a ready market for the maize they are producing and some of the um, 
ingredients they're doing like soya beans but the soya beans what we do is we kind of link up with people who are training others how to do this um, soya bean products, milk, um, cake, and those things. So when they are able to process them and do that, whatever is left, they can give to us to add to our feed ingredients. And then when we also finish, at the end of the day, we produce the eggs, we have some people pick eggs from us and sell. So we're creating a chain. And that is what we are telling them. So if you're producing maize, you don't necessarily have to go to the farm and farm maize and all this. Thing. You can just link up with someone who is farming the maize. And then when they do, they sell them to you. You process it into flour, which almost everybody in our places use. And so diversification is one way they are going about us. If not, the droughts and the flood are really affecting us. And but it's a serious issue. Taking a big picture look, how do we, maybe Silly, you can speak to this, how do we ensure that the global response to climate change, we have a conference coming up in Paris um, in a month, how do we ensure that our response takes into account the special needs of women in agriculture? Well, we already know that climate change is not gender neutral, and we know that it affects the poorest the most, and women constitute the majority of the poorest. <laughs> so we already have sort of a, a circumstantial case for why climate change will disproportionately, has been disproportionately impacting women, and why women have been really on this front line of mitigation um, techniques, right, like the ones that we've been discussing. From, from our perspective at Landessa, we obviously look at what does secure right to land mean in terms of climate change, right? And there are multiple studies that show that when people don't have secure rights to their land, they're less incentivized to think about the soil conservation, less incentivized to plant trees, because they may not actually be benefiting from the improvements that they're making to that land that may be taken away from them at any moment, right? So there really isn't that incentive. And so converse, you know, studies that show that when, once people do get secure rights to land, they do start thinking about it in terms of long term, in terms of soil quality, in terms of planting trees. And we see that over and again. And particularly when women get secure rights to land, they're not just thinking about that, but they're also thinking in terms of feeding families and what that means then for food security and for ending um, hunger and poverty. So our focus has really been on looking at sort of women at that core of that equation because they are going to be the most affected and they are really in a way the key to the solution. I would like to draw your attention to a bunch of women in Cameroon who suddenly found that the climate had become a great deal wetter and so they were losing, their post-harvest losses were huge. Um, post-harvest losses are a real problem everywhere in the world, as you know, about 35% of food is lost one way or another th throughout the chain. Um, so what they did was they gathered the fruit and they worked this out amongst themselves. Um, we did a study on it, it was absolutely fascinating. That they collected the, food, the, the fruit and they converted it, uh, they cooked it and converted it and made it into a product which could be tinned or bottled and of course therefore kept and not destroyed and they, then it could be sold through a completely different set, a cooperative than what they normally use. They tried making wine out of it. You wouldn't like it too much, but you know, if you can't get hold of a Merlot there, I should be very pleased to have that. <laughs> they, they do a lot, of, that is real, I, that's a kind of real imagination which a group of women working together in a, in, in a community can try to do to, to um, change the, how climate, climate change really, really goes to them. I think climate change, one of the more appalling things, and Rupa mentioned you know, these awful tragedies which go on in certain parts of the world. In Bangladesh in 1991, 14 women died for every man as a result of the uh, typhoon. And some studies were done, and then 10 years later, there was another typhoon, and this time, it was only five women lost per man. Well, what was it? I mean, not that that is good, but it is an improvement. <laughs> what happened in between? Well, they found that women didn't like to go to the cyclone shelters. Uh, they weren't safe. It wasn't safe for them or for their children. There weren't separate toilets. 
They, it took a long time to find the children. You have to go around and gather up six children to, to go to a, a, a cyclone shelter. You may not be able to. Um, and they needed guardians in the area if they were going to go to such a shelter for, for their children and for themselves. And this kind of um, arrangement was, was made whereby guardians did go in. With groups of women went in together with their children to the cyclones. They arranged a, uh, a pre-meeting area where they could all go in and, uh, and take food with them. And once inside, there was some assurance of safety, not complete, but some, which made them more confident. Um, that's a kind of thing which shows that women are, you know, because of the lack of resilience, uh, some of these, these tragedies are really impactful, and yes, of course it impacts their whole lives, including where their, their work as a, a farmer, whether it's a permanent farming work or whether it's something you do in the evening um, and, and the first thing in the morning when, when you're not dealing with the children. Um, the, the impact, the difference between, uh, of climate change, the impact on women versus men is huge. I want to get to questions from the audience, but what I want to do is have a closing thought from each of you about what you think it will take for women to achieve gender parity in agriculture, let's say, in the next decade. I'm giving it a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, <laughs> well, I do think mainstreaming gender in anything you do is really important, and I think it's true for, peop for women in the world anywhere, that if you can influence the representation of gender, if you can be a role model, if you can assist with education of women, whether it's in farming or, or in anything else, we will get further. Um, I think in order to do it in 10 years, I think we've got to get rid of a few wars, Melissa, which are not anything to do with women. Um, um, all they do is exacerbate their problems. But I do think that for many people, many people, f for different reasons in the world, they do not put a high enough priority on getting gender representation in leadership and uh, in equity, in fairness, in land, in under the law, equity under the law throughout the world. I absolutely I agree with Lynn. So for most people, in a nutshell, it's ignorant. They mm -hmm. don't even know how these things, if uh, given attention, is going to change our situation and help us to achieve more than we already are doing. So if uh, women uh, are maybe um, interventions towards uh, reducing poverty and those things in the are, um, are giving more priority to women, women more centered and uh, women-centered um, initiatives, which can uh, range from capacity building to actually availing them with the resources, and then also encouraging them to diversify in their economic activities and those things. I think it will go a long way to kind of uh, help us. Well, landlessness is one of the best predictors for poverty and hunger. Mm -hmm. And so having secure rights to land is really a way of getting a gateway to many other rights that we've been talking about. And one really exciting progress point for all of us to keep in mind is that this year, the international community, the United Nations adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. And three of those goals actually mention access mm -hmm. and control of land, including for women. And those three goals are <coughs> the goal to end poverty, to ensure food security, and to ensure women's empowerment and gender equality. So having that in the sustainable development goals actually gives us a tool and an incentive mm -hmm. to make sure that countries are monitoring that progress and that we have a way as, as individuals on the national mm -hmm. level and on the international yes. level of accountability to make sure that there is progress towards that. So I think that might be a really important and powerful tool to think about as we move forward. Great. Thank you all. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Yes.
That's a loaded question, but... Well, I completely agree with you. I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, religion is, uh, has been a very, very much an enemy of gender parity, I'm afraid, although it is counterintuitive. Counter but uh, in many ways throughout the world, religion has been wholly unhelpful. And the more um, uh, traditional the religion, the more, more right-wing, shall we say, uh, the more unhelpful it is. Well, I was just going to add that in the context of the right to food, one of the elements, other than obviously having it accessible and available, is that it should be culturally appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a challenge because, you know, we know of U.S. funded projects to introduce soybeans to areas where they would never eat soybeans. That was just never part of their understanding mm -hmm. of culture, and mm -hmm. they didn't hear that in California people love, you know, <laughs> their edamames, you know. So I think that, I think that it's the culturally appropriate part of it is really relevant um, when we're trying to address these issues, and that's why the community involvement and in how you solve the problem can get you at some of those solutions. The more one educates, the better it will be, and the better for women. Everyone knows the results about what happens if you educate a woman, um, and how much, how, much, how far the standard of living of the, the family goes up. Um, I also wanted to comment on your diversification point. Diversification is absolutely essential for female farmers because they are so vulnerable um, to, to climate and to uh, man-made uh, horrors of one sort or another everywhere diversification will help and if you could persuade those people to uh, make some cheese I think it would be terrific <coughs> yes uh, I totally agree with your concerns about the whole seed the restrictions uh, potential restrictions mm -hmm. on seeds isn't one other issue that with GMO seeds they morph over generations and that you don't necessarily get the same crop the next time even if you could replant Mm -hmm. that product. I mean, I think hybridization and, and um, genetic modification, it's my understanding that it means that you don't necessarily get that same pure product generation after generation. No, that's quite right, because one is always trying to improve the, uh, improve the strain, improve the variety, and it may not always work. That is why we keep these family trees. Right. So that you can actually add the original seeds and the original germplasm so that one can get a wild variety back in and start again from scratch if you have to. I mean, we, we are very careful. We never mix GMOs or science involving GMOs with any of the science. We have separate labs and everything for the, um, the regular science. But the, as I say, you cannot ignore GMOs because of the desperate need to increase increased productivity. Yes, we have to be very careful. We have a number of plots, you know, we try different types of things and we watch them grow. Very exciting, walk around a wheat field, you see some of them are brown, and some are, look beautiful, and some you could take and eat now, and some have died, and, and these are different strains which have been tried. I think, I think uh, there's a lot of sensationalism about GMOs, but if they are carefully used um, and not with a purpose of just making a profit, but actually trying to improve strains and availability to poor farmers around the world through international public goods, it does become a different thing. Thank you. And uh, to add to what he, she just said, um, one worry about um, the farmers have is, even if they can keep the, they agree that they can keep seeds, we're looking at the resist its resistance to some of the diseases and pests that we have because some of the local varieties that we have they are really very resistant especially to our weather conditions and when you plant them it, a typical example is the um, the hybrid chicken that we have when you try to raise the local chicken as against the hybrid chicken you 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 can you tend to lose a lot of the hybrid ones because of their resistance to some of the diseases that we have back home. So that's one worry why people are kicking against the person of the same seed bill. Mm -hmm. 
a very good question. Um, I have much more concern about their psycholo psychology. I think it's a dreadful place for people to be over a long term. You know, there's no, there are not very easy, durable solutions. There are 60 million refugees in the world at the moment. Um, I think about 10 years ago there was only 35 million. Uh, and they're increasing every day, as we all know. Um, camps are not the durable solution. It's not what is needed for anyone, women, children, most particularly children who, who get spotty education. Um, and there is no chance of working in the country where the camp is situated because, of course, the, the country themselves, having been generously given the land, is very wary of uh, jobs being taken from the local population. Um, in fact, there's, there are several initiatives going on to try and get money into the camps. Once you get money into the camps, then they can go out and buy food. Uh, they get vouchers, of course. They get vouchers from the World Food Program uh, and the, um, the High Commission for Refugees. They used to get food. Those, those were in the days when there was a surplus around the world of different cereals which could be given uh, so that it could be handed out. Um, doesn't exist now. In fact, we've all heard the World Food Program's sad, uh, sad story. So they get cash vouchers, which produces its own problems, as you can well imagine. You give them to the women, not to the men, uh, but, uh, and, and that way the children get better fed. There are, some of the camps in the world are very good at growing their own food. The people have gone in and provided uh, basic uh, materials and uh, for a common plot to grow uh, some th things like lentils, which are fairly, fairly hardy under certain conditions and which provide a lot of, uh, of nutrients. Um, you know, refugees, like everybody else in the world, tend to want their own bit. So it's, it communi that kind of community work is unfortunately not as good as it should be. I could talk at great length about refugee camps. Um, it, it is a problem. It is a problem. It's not actually the biggest problem, because they do have water, they do have sanitation, they do have basic food, not terrific, but, but they have enough nutrients to get, to get through. There's, a, there's always stores on the, uh, um, in the camps which, where people can go and cash their vouchers if they don't want to go outside to the, the public. But um, uh, there are some enormous other problems with, with the camps. You're quite, quite right to point that out. I want to thank the three of you. And if you have any other questions, you, you're hanging around for lunch, right? So. I, I will not. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many people are still smoking? And you know, nicotine is a really good cognitive enhancer. Um, and yeah, it works, it makes people focus your attention. I mean, that's why people like to smoke. It is also very addicting and it also has a terrible drug delivery problem. So I mean, but it's not the nicotine that's the problem. It's the, it's the drug delivery mechanism which has been so bad.